Uh, this is Noah Mashinator Solutions Architect with DQ Systems. Happy to have everybody. Um, here to talk about tips for management, how accessibility testing actually impacts your organization. So uh, today's webinar is geared towards those who have been recently tasked with accessibility in their respective organizations, or are maybe starting to think about how to uh, automate accessibility testing, you know, really take it to the next level, um, or are just generally curious about different ways to implement testing into their organization. Um, you know, really thinking about where, where can I fit in accessibility along the way? Um, we'll answer some common questions people have when they're curious about how accessibility will impact their current organization and developers. Um, so <clears throat> just to kind of summarize that today, we will take a look at the impacts of proper tooling, try and illustrate uh, where and why we can inject tools to make accessibility testing part of, you know, part of the business as usual within the organization, uh, really keeping an eye on sustainability with, with, with uh, regard to accessibility. We'll also cover uh, common questions and considerations with regard to tooling. So focusing in on, you know, what are the key factors in understanding what tools are best, you know, specifically for me, for my organization? Um, how can I make the best use of them within the processes I've, I've got in place? Uh, and then finally, we'll go through a little brief demonstration of different ways uh, to leverage tools to make substantial gains uh, with regard to accessibility testing. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully with uh, uh, low low resource cost. Um, so the introduction of proper tooling for accessibility testing throughout the software development lifecycle is one of the most vital parts of a sustainable, cost-effective, and overall successful accessibility program for any organization. Proper tooling empowers product teams to design, develop, test and release accessible content by leveraging automation wherever possible and stopping unnecessary bugs from making their way downstream. Um, you know, the earlier we catch bugs and fix things in the development process, uh, the cheaper they are to handle. So kind of framing this conversation uh, around the software development lifecycle, we are looking, uh, here I have a, a diagram of uh, an, an agile-ish software development lifecycle. This is sort of a generic diagram. Uh, we start on the left of the diagram, looking at design and wireframing. We, we move into creating a product and sprint backlog, uh, then pushing into actual development um, with uh, sprints that go through then a QA process and become shippable product, um, and then are deployed. So this is a fairly generic, you know, agile-ish software development diagram. Um, and in today, even still, uh, as has been the case for a while, most accessibility activity is done all the way at the end of the software development lifecycle. So um, after we've, we've designed, developed, tested, and deployed a product, that seems to be when most organizations are still testing for accessibility. Um, now, this is uh, not a very cost-effective way to handle the problem. It's not a very sustainable way to handle accessibility. Um, sort of like you, you could think about this like you have built a car uh, in its entirety, uh, but you didn't put air conditioning in it. And after the car is built and on the road, somebody decides they want to put air conditioning in the car. Uh, well, it takes a lot of effort to, to take out all the, the parts necessary to fit in an air conditioning, you know, compressor and ductwork and all that um, to the car. And then you have to put everything back together and make sure that it all still works, which is extremely, you know, expensive, extremely difficult. Uh, you know, that, that analogy is the same for accessibility, right? If we built a product, uh, we find that there are accessibility violations or deficiencies, we then necessarily have to take some things apart, make some changes, and then try and put it all back together again without injecting some new functional or accessibility uh, bugs along the way. So it's, it's really expensive way um, to look at this uh, requirement. So uh, here at DQ, we talk about, you know, the use of tools and, uh, uh, you know, there, there are products and services that assist organizations throughout the development lifecycle. So in essence, we want to shift left with accessibility testing uh, as much as possible. So here we are looking at that same diagram, uh, starting with wireframe and design on the left and ending in, in, in deployment after you know, development and testing and whatnot. And we see that there are, there are several points at which throughout the development lifecycle, we can inject tooling uh, to make you know, great strides in terms of uh, reducing the number of accessibility bugs that make their way downstream. 
So uh, starting all the way at the left with design and wireframes and creating backlog, um, you know, designing with inclusivity uh, is absolutely uh, a key part of, of getting an accessibility program kind of to that next level. Uh, the design is, is, is one of the broadest touching uh, stages in the software development lifecycle with regard to accessibility. And so there are trainings and, and services and education about how to design with inclusivity, about how to create, you know, uh, uh, annotated wireframes so that the backlog is, is created in such a way so as to maintain as, you know, as much accessibility as problem at that stage. Um, but once we get into development, that's when we really start getting into tools. So, uh, you know, automated accessibility testing during development um, you know, upstream of, of QA uh, is, a, is a huge uh, gainer to be made in terms of when to do accessibility testing. So there are tools for developers that can empower them to catch, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of accessibility bugs in a given project um, during development. So these can be things that they use while they're actually, you know, coding and, and building in their environment. There are um, automated utilities that allow for, um, you know, automation to move through a project and, and, and create new screen states and, and test along the way, uh, as well as um, leveraging existing automation. You know, if you have uh, a, a proper, you know, CI, CD, continuous development pipeline and you're doing automated testing, you know, accessibility testing, there are tools that allow it to be part and parcel of, of that existing tool chain so that you can capture and fix uh, accessibility issues you know, during development, during the build, so they don't make their way into QA, um, you know, where it's, again, it's more expensive to, to find and fix issues once they've made it past that development phase. Now, after uh, development, you know, you, you can only kept, capture so much uh, through automation. Um, you cannot capture 100% of accessibility violations through automation. Um, so uh, there is some necessary manual testing. This typically happens during the QA phase. Um, but there are, you know, tools that help you to kind of optimize your accessibility uh, testing, tracking, uh, and reporting with step-by-step -step guidance, report building, uh, you know, tools that help, you know, empower your QA team uh, to, to do that testing without requiring them uh, maybe to all be accessibility experts or, um, you know, like that. So, so tools that help them to, to be consistent, to be efficient with their accessibility testing. Um, finally, keeping an eye on uh, accessibility of our live sites, our, our live properties, applications, uh, you know, you, you want to have continuous tracking and reporting capabilities, so you want to employ some sort of scanning and monitoring tool. This provides automated regression testing, uh, you know, for your existing digital content, um, you know, to keep an eye on, on the progress or the trending of, of becoming more accessible. Or if you have content that is highly accessible, you want to make sure that small changes, content updates, to those properties aren't going to inject some sort of uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of accessibility. So you want sort of a smoke alarm out there uh, running automated scans, covering your content, and, and informing you uh, when new accessibility issues might become uh, present. So there are proper places for tooling in, uh, you know, in the software development lifecycle, and it doesn't all need to happen at the end. So proper tooling is what empowers you to, to capture these issues further left earlier in the development process. This is, is just kind of reinforcing that fact. So we're looking at a, a chart that's comparing relative cost of uh, finding and fixing bugs, uh, you know, in a project. So this is based off uh, some research IBM did. Um, but, you know, finding and fixing an issue in development uh, can cost, you know, on, on average from this study about 80 bucks, right? So it maybe takes an hour or two of a developer's time to find something and fix it while they're developing. Um, as soon as that makes it into a build, you know, that, that, relative cost has tripled. And again, you know, in QA, you get another uh, multiplier in there. And as, as soon as we're out post-production during the maintenance of a product, you know, we've, we've got two orders of magnitude on the relative cost of fixing a bug. Um, and so, you know, taking this lens and applying it to accessibility, just reinforcing the fact that we want to shift as far left as possible with as much as possible so we can find and fix issues when it's most cost effective. Um, so again, how, how do I make sustain, or accessibility sustainable? So, you know, tooling is a big part of this, right? We want, we want to not only make something accessible once, you know, the accessibility journey uh, doesn't really end. So we need a program that's going to be sustainable, right? So, you know, the kind of tenets of 
creating a sustainable accessibility program is to you know really shift left as much as possible to, to make high impact low in, in investment uh, shifts in process um, to, to, to cut down the, the velocity of bugs that make their way through through the pipeline um, then you know we want to employ as much automation as possible you know where automation exists in testing uh, we want to leverage those structures for, for accessibility testing um, this is going to be a huge part of making this program sustainable and cost effective. Um, and then finally, you know, training and awareness to cut back on repeat bugs. So if we've if we've found and fixed issues of a given flavor, training and awareness can help prevent those issues from ever making their way into the, the product uh, ever again. So these are some of the kind of the primary tenants and, um, uh, you know, making an accessibility program sustainable. And tooling is a big part of all three, right? So tools for developers help to kind of, uh, front load, you know, and, and capture as much of these issues as you can early in the process. Uh, proper tooling and development and QA allow you to leverage automation as much as possible. And then tools that help deliver, you know, documentation around what issues are uh, present. Why, why are these things issues? What success criteria do they violate? You know, who, who are the people that these, these different violations affect? Uh, really help to cement in testers and developers, you know, why, why are these accessibility you know, violations, uh, why do they matter? And, and how do we prevent them from happening in the future? So you want tools that help provide that sort of education and awareness uh, as part of their reporting. Um, so now let's talk about some considerations for tooling. You know, there are a number of different solutions out there at, at various stages, tools for developers, tools for QA, uh, et cetera. And so it's important to consider which solution is best fit for your specific organization. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of uh, go back to this software development lifecycle uh, diagram, uh, same one that we, we've had up here in the past, just to reinforce that we are talking about, you know, we, we have tools uh, for developers out there in, in, you know, in the industry. There are tools for QA and there are tools for for scanning and monitoring. And so we want to think about the considerations for each of these tools at their various stages. You know, what, what do we want to keep in mind so that we can get maximum value with, uh, you know, the lowest disruption to you know, existing processes as possible. <clears throat> so what tools are right for me in my environment? You know, you as, as a, a product manager or a development manager or, you know, somewhere in, uh, in the development life cycle, you, you have process, you have tool chains um, already put in place for a lot of different reasons. You've made architectural decisions uh, to, to make sure that you're, you're, you're building in the right way. You've got security under wraps. You, you've got all these different considerations around your, your product or, or digital property. Uh, and those arch architectural decisions uh, have already been made. So adding in testing for accessibility shouldn't compromise those decisions. You, you will want to bring in accessibility tools that work harmoniously with the tool chain you already have in place. So you're looking for tools that are architecture agnostic, right? So you want, um, you know, uh, APIs and browser extensions and, and different utilities that can work within the structures you already have in place uh, and not have to make architectural changes to compensate for this new accessibility testing capabilities you want to add in. Um, these tools should meet your security needs. So uh, as I'm sure a lot of you have, have security concerns, you need tools that work behind a, a firewall as, as part of, of some security policy organization has in place. So you need tools that, uh, you know, work behind your firewall that are self-contained or on-prem uh, versus SaaS. Uh, or maybe you'd rather work in a, in a SaaS environment and you need tools that do that. Um, so you want tools that kind of work within your developer's environment. You don't want to constrain your developer uh, to some specific environment just because you want to bring in accessibility testing tools. So you want tools that are architecture agnostic, that, that remain secure, uh, and that fit in with your process and tech stack regardless of, of what it is. So uh, once we've, we've made a selection of, of tools that fit our environment, that fit our tool chain, et cetera, um, we start taking a, a look at uh, the automation, right? So how do I automate more? Um, you know, as discussed earlier, automation is key. You know, let's focus on the development side of this. There are a number of different ways to use automation uh, testing in developers, uh, you know, using existing process that they already have in place. So not even changing what they're doing every day to find and fix bugs as they go downstream. 
you know, during development, if I'm a developer and I, I'm, I'm constructing some new component, you know, I could use something like a browser extension uh, like Axe to, to quickly scan inside my environment in the browser, you know, to make sure there are no easy to catch accessibility bugs before I go checking my content into, um, you know, the daily build or what have you. So this is something that, that, you know, these are free tools. This is something that can be done in their environment. Um, without having to have some sort of large automation architecture in place. It's something that they can just do every day with the stuff that they're working on uh, already. You know, um, then, then if you want to start taking a look at something a little bit more sophisticated, maybe you've got an interactive user flow, some sort of data-driven user flow that you want to interrogate. So this could be something like an, uh, like an add to cart flow. And you want to uh, be able to create uh, some sort of lightweight testing that drives your content through these various screen states, emulating that user flow and gathering accessibility data at the same time. Uh, now, if you had some sort of end-to-end -end or unit testing, you know, automation already in place, that's great. There are going to be tools that exist to kind of piggyback off of that, that stuff, uh, that architecture. But if you don't have those testing structures already in place, you know, there, there are also tools that allow you to rapid prototype, uh, you know, these sort of ad hoc, scripts that, that you can you can drive some accessibility testing through um, and then also you know at the, at the highest level you know maybe you've got uh, that CI CD pipeline already built up and in place and you want to make accessibility testing part of that part of your automated build process um, you know there are tools that exist that are specifically designed to work into those uh, testing architectures and so you can you can make accessibility testing you know part and parcel of your end-to-end -end testing of your regression testing of your unit testing um, so that the, the accessibility testing is completely automated um, and, and you're really getting all of that good test data to understand what's wrong, where is it wrong, and how to fix it um, as part of an uh, automated process that already exists you know, for the rest of your front-end testing needs. It's not an extra step. It's not extra work. It's just part of the business-as-usual testing. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of this uh, you know, developer testing in, in real life. Um, so uh, I am going to back out of that. So, um, you know, it, let's, let's take a look at what, what does, you know, proper tooling provide for me if I'm a developer? That's the first thing we're going to take a look at. So I'm, I'm Noah the developer. I'm building a new component. I, I have this fancy to-do list widget uh, that I want to add into my, my organization's product, uh, but before I check in my code, I want to quickly see if there are any, uh, you know, accessibility issues that I can find and fix right now, right? Like, why let those things go down to QA? So I'm going to grab my Axe browser extension uh, and quickly run a scan. So I'm in the browser. I've got my content up. I, I open up Axe, and I take a quick scan of my screen state, and then I realize I do have some, some issues here. Uh, I have uh, in front of me, the browser extension is telling me I have four violations. Um, I can highlight or inspect the DOM to see, you know, where do these issues exist in, in the page, in the DOM. Um, I can uh, link out to some documentation to get that understanding of what's wrong and, and how to fix it, and also get a, a quick understanding of how to fix this issue, right? So all inside my environment before I, I check in my code, I have everything I need to be able to maybe find and fix some stuff. Now, as it stands, uh, I have three color contrast issues and one uh, form element without a label. Um, now, I, I, in my specific organization, uh, Laura and the marketing team rule with an iron fist, and I don't actually get to control the colors and the styling, um, so I can't do anything about that. But I can fix this form element that's missing a label. Um, so, you know, my tool is going to tell me, you know, how to fix this stuff. Um, I'm going to just real quick look at the DOM and see that um, I actually do have a label for my form element, but it's got a typo in it. I, I, I must have fat fingered when I was typing, and I, I, it was supposed to be new dash to do, because uh, that's the name of the form ID, but I put in new dash one to do. And so if I fix that in the DOM, which is sort of a temporary fix, and I run my scan again, I see that my form element label uh, violation is no more. Uh, so I've sort of, I've achieved ax clean uh, to the extent that I can within my organization, and uh, I'm ready to, to, to check in my progress and move on with the rest of my day. So this is a very low barrier of entry, um, high reward 
uh, you know, use case for automation, you know, tooling in the developer's environment. So it's, it's automated in that I just click a button, it runs, you know, some list of, of you know, 40, 50 rules that, that is going to tell me what's wrong and, and where's it wrong and how to fix it. And I can, I can do all that on my own without being an accessibility expert, you know, without employing some large um, testing structure and, and make sure that I've got, you know, 30, 40, 50% of, of any possible violations in my project are already dealt with before we get to QA. Now, this starts to get a little bit more sophisticated or interesting when I realize that, you know, I, uh, I have a sort of dynamic screen state here, right? I, I can, uh, you know, create a, a to-do list to, to, to say, you know, tell Laura, thanks, uh, pet Dixie, the office dog. And, and I'm creating new screen real estate uh, when I add stuff to my to-do list. And when I hit the check mark on this to-do list, I'm creating, you know, color changes. And again, I'm, I'm creating a, a different screen state. So what if I want to create an automated test that will run this same browser extension scan um, at each of these three screen states without me having to um, manually click the button, right? So if I have an end-to-end -end test already set up for this project, I, I, you know, there are tools that allow me to piggyback off that and we'll take a look at it. But, uh, you know, in, in this current pretend world, let's say I don't have that and I need something that's a little bit more ad hoc. So um, you'll want a tool out there that, that allows you to create scripts sort of on the fly. Um, and we, uh, we at DQ have such a tool, but, but, but you know, more importantly, they, they exist. And so um, if we take a look at uh, that, pardon the, there we go. I'm going to pull up a script here so that we can get an idea of what that looks like. It wouldn't be a live demo if something didn't go just a little bit wrong. Um, here we go. So taking a look at, you know, what a script like this might look like, you know, employing something similar to a, a Gherkin or natural language uh, scripting here, I, I can create this flow uh, really quickly, right? Just sort of typing this out on the fly as different actions I want my tool to take. Um, we're, we're looking at an editor in here and, I, and I've got, I'm telling my tool to go to a given page and then run these, this series of actions to, you know, land on the page, take a scan, um, enter a to-do into my to-do list and press enter, enter a second to-do, enter a third to-do, run a scan, and then click them all as done and run a third scan, right? So I'm going through this dynamic, um, running through this dynamic script here and gathering, you know, interstitial scan data along the way. And then for me in the tool that I'm using, I, I ultimately run this through, a uh, command line interface the terminal this could be easily called you know from uh, a build process like in Jenkins or something like that um, you know it's just a, a shell command and so I'm going to run through it's going to take a scan uh, where we're now automated driving this through the browser right now it's, it's running through the process running the scans uh, and then it tells me it's done and generates a report now uh, as we take a look at the report itself which I will pull back up. We see that, you know, it's, it's creating a report for me. And this is a key aspect of, of tooling in general is, is it's one thing to identify the issues, but we want to create a report that's, that's descriptive and actionable, right? We want to know what is the issue. We want to know where are these issues and we want to know, you know, how do I fix these issues? So, you know, I have a tool that's doing that for me. Um, and, and it's, it's delivering to me, you know, as through these different, uh, dynamic stages, it took a scan when it loaded the page. Um, the next section is when I added to do's, it took another scan. It's telling me what violations exist there. And then finally, once I marked the to do's as done, it took a third scan. And so, you know, I've got a single report that's got all three of those screen states listed out for me. Again, what were the issues found? Where did these issues exist? And give me some documentation on how to fix them. Right? So this is a key part of, of that reporting. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we talked about what if I do have a full on CI CD pipeline in place, right? So if we take a look at a Jenkins instance, which is what I have here, you know, I have a project that's running automated tests. Um, I've, I've got a reporting process in place. And as I look at my build statistics, um, I've actually been able to pass in my accessibility test data. To, to report through the Jenkins reporting structure. So now I'm, I'm reporting in the same channel that the rest of my build, uh, 
build test reports are coming through. So that means that my development managers, my product managers can go to the same place and get the accessibility test data at the same time that they're getting the build data. And in terms of, you know, what does an integration like that look like? Because you don't want to have to do a whole bunch of extra work to try and add in the accessibility testing to, to, to part of, you know, the testing that's already there. So if I have um, some automated testing already built uh, here, we're back in my editor. I'm, I'm looking at uh, an end-to-end -end test uh, for this to-do list application. It's, it's got three simple tests written in it just for this demonstration. Um, the, the application I've, I've been uh, demoing here is an Angular application. And so naturally I'm using Protractor to, to run my end-to-end -end testing. Um, I've got these three tests already set up in it uh, to check that it has a title, to add a to-do, and to mark the to-do is done. And it's just making sure that functionally these things are happening. So if I want to add in accessibility testing as part of that, um, all I really need to do is bring in uh, a few uh, dependencies to run my, my APIs. Uh, and then, you know, after I run my functional test, I can drop in and, and await and, and make my asynchronous call to my API, generate a set of results, feed it to my reporter, and, and that's it. So a couple lines of, of essentially cookie cutter code allow me to add accessibility testing to each of these three it blocks gathering test data at the same time I'm doing, you know, functional testing, I'm getting accessibility testing data. And then again, we're pushing those results uh, up into my CI CD pipeline. So the idea is that, you know, that through some small front end effort of, of dropping in some APIs or, or something like that to existing tests, I'm going to be piggybacking off of all the hard work that, that my team has already done. You know, blood, sweat and tears went into creating this automated testing structure and I just want to piggyback off that good work to create accessibility test data at the exact same time. This is a really, really key part of making a successful, sustainable, you know, cost-effective accessibility testing practice within my development organization. I'm, I'm using the same testing structures <clears throat> and I'm passing reporting into the same places that I'm doing the rest of my build reporting. <clears throat> um, this was focusing on this was focusing on the development aspect of tooling, um, and as stated earlier, automated testing really really huge part of successful accessibility program, but still you know only captures 30, 40, 50 percent of accessibility issues in a, in a given project. Um, so we ne kind of necessarily need to talk about what about tooling for manual testing, right? So um, manual testing is is absolutely necessary if you want to achieve you know, full compliance with, you know, your desired WCAG standard or 508. Um, it's absolutely necessary to achieve that level of compliance. And so tooling in manual testing for, for QA provides, you know, uh, uh, a culture of consistency, right? So one of the things we see in the field most commonly around, you know, uh, pain felt in the manual testing phase for accessibility is inconsistency. You know, there, because we're talking about guidelines for accessibility, there's necessarily interpretation of those guidelines to any specific um, project. And so uh, it's very common to have, uh, you know, a couple of different subject matter experts testing content and making different interpretations of guidelines and coming up with different sets of results. Um, you know, and this is this is a big time cost uh, center, right? I mean, you've got then you've got two different sets of results or two different interpretations. That necessarily means you know somebody needs to go back through and figure out which is the the ideal interpretation for you know the organization. And so that that that's rework, that's double time, that's extra cost. So building a culture of consistency is a huge time saver. And deploying proper tooling in manual testing allows you to set up a consistent deterministic uh, testing methodology that everybody's using. So everybody doing manual testing is doing it in the same process, is doing it in the same order, and is leveraging the same you know, guideline interpretations so they come up with the same results, right? So huge, huge gains in terms of consistency and ultimately time saving. Another big aspect of, of tooling in you know, manual testing is the ability to educate testers, right? So by delivering you know, proper support and, and uh, layout of a project and, and testing methodology, you can be diversifying a resource pool of people who can actually do this testing. Um, unfortunately for uh, the internet, accessibility experts don't uh, necessarily grow on trees. There's not a, there's not 
uh, an overabundance of them out there. And so being able to maybe diversify that resource pool of, of who can participate in the accessibility testing in the manual process um, is a huge cost you know, saver as well for an organization. So a tool that deploys proper support materials um, on how to test and how to interpret can help to educate novice testers uh, and, and really, really diversify that resource pool. And then finally, like any good uh, testing tool, you wanna be able to build and parse projects into official, uh, efficient workflows uh, to help you know, improve collaboration, improve parallelization of the work being done, um, you know, and just gain efficiencies that way in, in how we're doing work. Uh, and then finally, you wanna be able to build out and leverage a comprehensive list of checkpoints to make sure that everybody's testing the, to the same level of compliance and also testing you know, to, to the total level of compliance the organization needs, right? You wanna make sure that everybody's testing the same way, testing through the same set of rigorous checkpoints so that you know, we've achieved the WCAG 2.0 AA standard that we want. We wanna feel confident that, that our, our, our properties are all there, that our native mobile apps are there, that our desktop you know, applications are there. You need a tool that helps deliver, you know, consistent, effective support to, to achieve that level of, of compliance. Uh, finally, you know, we talked about scanning and monitoring on the back end. So there are two, you know, really key features to a scanning and monitoring tool that you want to consider. Um, we want something that's going to be able to scan the content uh, that we want. So it needs to be able to, um, you know, uh, establish scheduled automated scans so that I can keep an eye on my properties without having to actively, you know, watch them, something that's going to be more like a passive smoke alarm. So you want a scanning and monitoring tool that's going to be able to be automated, that's going to be able to, to schedule scans and send out reports or alerts when things go beyond, you know, a certain threshold of accessibility that, that your organization deems fit. You also want to be able to scope out the content specifically you want to keep your reporting clean you're gonna maybe need uh, scripting capabilities to set up specific screen states or, or uh, you know, establish session variables or maybe change viewport sizes. You, know, you really wanna have control of the scan to be able to scan exactly the content you want. You know, get through that authentication barrier so you can scan the my account portion of your website. Um, you need a scanning platform that's robust enough to make its way through that. Uh, you want to have good reporting. So that's the other aspect of that is it's not just the scanning and gathering the data, but it's the communication and distribution of those reports. So you want to have, you know, detailed reports. You want to have high level reports so that, you know, people at, at every level of your organization where the information matters to them, they get access to the level of reporting that they're after. So you might have executive level dashboards, which is what you see in the image here on the screen. Um, is something that's very high level so that maybe an executive just wants to keep an eye on the, the overtime trend or, you know, hey, why are we making more issues uh, from an accessibility standpoint with this one business unit? What's going on there? Um, keeping that high level. Or maybe you want to be able to filter and focus down onto uh, specific issue types that are, 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 you know, matter most to you because you're um, a developer and you work on this one specific part of the project. So you want to have, you know, interactive reports that allow you to get into the data you know, get the details on demand and filter and focus in on exactly what you want. Uh, and then ultimately, all this information needs to be shareable. So you either need to have a centrally located, you know, report repo or generate some sort of read-only links to reports so you can distribute them, uh, you know, as needed or automatically. Uh, but this is a really key part of, uh, you know, once you've achieved accessibility, keeping an eye on it, right? This is the smoke alarm you need uh, to be able to, uh, know when you're when you're trending in a positive direction or when something has changed and, and broken and you need to to make uh, uh, make amends with that as, as fast as possible um, <clears throat> so it's hard to believe but we've 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 crushed through about 40 minutes today and so just to kind of summarize you know again we we see that proper tooling is absolutely vital to taking an accessibility program to, to kind of taking it to level two, achieving sustainability uh, with your accessibility testing. You know, and, and it's important to know that tools exist that exactly fit for your organization. So there's no need to settle for less, to, to settle for tools that make you make compromises in what you're looking for or what you're already doing well. Tools exist that allow you to keep doing you know what you're doing, but but really integrating the accessibility testing as, as part and parcel of your business as usual process. Um, and it should be important to know that there are low barrier of entry solutions as well as robust 
you know, enterprise level solutions. So no matter where you are in your accessibility journey, you know, tools exist to help uh, make accessibility part of your everyday process, to make accessibility more cost effective, um, to make accessibility easier uh, for, for your organization. And so, you know, again, this goes back to that the right tools are out there to fit your organization and, and it's very powerful to have them. Um, this kind of brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, I know that the slides will be put up here, but we've, we've got uh, a picture of our beautiful company, but also, you know, some links out to our uh, various uh, social media uh, and online connections, you know, GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Great. Thanks, Noah. So I think now that we have finished that up, I think we can move to questions. We've got some pending here for you. Um, great job, by the way, in presenting. Um, so I know what, when you were, you were talking, you were talking about the different levels of automation and how they can fit in with uh, wherever your organization is um, maturity-wise. Um, Megna asks, uh, what's the difference between the Axe um, browser extension or uh, rules Lent, um, library that you showed um, and the attest uh, browser plugin. Sure, yeah. So, <clears throat> specific, like, uh, technologically speaking, the, the two browser plugins uh, differ in a few key ways. Um, the Axe browser extension is, is always built to leverage the most up to date um, Axe rules. Um, it allows you to uh, identify. Uh, issues in the browser, you know, while you're working, just like you saw me use there. Um, the a test browser extension uh, allows for your organization to have control over rules versioning. So if you want to employ a different set of Axe rules or Axe rules as they apply to different standards, so maybe instead of being WCAG 2.0 AA, which is the Axe uh, rule standard, you want to go to single A or 508 or um, you, probably most importantly is leverage a custom set of rules. So your organization might want to uh, insert, you know, some, some rules that, that, that work for your organization or maybe remove some rules. Like in my example, I, you know, I was saying Laura and the marketing team control colors and I can't do anything about that. So maybe I want to pull color contrast out of my rule set because I, it, it could be creating, um, you know, noise in my report because it's, they're, they're accessibility violations that I'm not allowed to fix. So you can create and, and use custom rules with a test. So WorldSpace a test is sort of the enterprise version of Axe, and with it come those sort of enterprise level features of controlling the versions of rules, using custom rules, exporting reports. So I can take a scan in my browser extension and then export those results to the, a spreadsheet so that I can then maybe turn it into JIRA tickets or something like that. Um, and then support. Um, as with any enterprise solution, you would have access to uh, the support of the software developer. Uh, Axe is a wonderful tool, but it is open source. So the, 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 the support there is also open source. Great, thanks Noah. I um, have another really good question here from Jonathan. He says, um, scans are static analysis, analysis of states. Um, much of accessibility deals with transition among states, such as context changes only on request, uh, keyboard navigate navigability, et cetera. Um, how is that aspect of accessibility testing automated? Sure, so if, if uh, these types of transitions are something that can be um, you know, automated through some sort of you know, uh, automated front end test to create these different screen states or transitions, um, you know, then you can leverage the, you know, the, the test runner automation or the web driver automation uh, to create those transitions for you. Um, and then, you know, invoke your testing APIs um, or even use something like that lightweight uh, scripting utility um, I, I mentioned earlier where you can create the flows yourselves and the transitions yourself um, to, to call those automated scans along the way. Um, if these types of specific screen states or, or transitions are not um, something that, that you are able to automate using a web driver technology, um, then maybe that's best sorted through uh, using something like a browser extension where you can manually create these transitions and, and scan them that way. Um, and depending on the type of issues you, you're encountering or, or trying to identify through, you know, keyboard navigation and whatnot, those are things that, that really can't be caught through automation. Um, there isn't, 
always a, a way for, for you to capture something through automation. Um, you know, keyboard navigation is one of them, right? So logical, logical order of navigation isn't something that can be asserted through automation. It, it requires human intervention to be able to decide whether or not the navigation that exists is in fact logical. Um, same with like alternative text for an image, right? Automation can tell you whether or not alternative text exists. However, it can't tell you if the uh, text that exists is in fact descriptive. And so some of those things just can't be automated and that's where the manual testing always comes in. Great, thanks Noah. Uh, another really good question here from Joshua. Uh, they ask, for an organization just starting out, uh, where would you recommend they start? Uh, in browser, um, testing, scripting? Um, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of, uh, I mean, the, the, the lowest barrier of entry that, that you know, I can think of is, is the free in-browser, you know, extension is a great place to, to just get going. Um, you know, open source tools are, are, are the obviously lowest barrier of entry because they're free. Um, and the browser extension is, is uh, you know, simple UI. It's built into the browser that you're using. And, you know, for, for Axe specifically, you know, there is um, Chrome and Firefox, so it can kind of meet you where you are. Um, but really, I mean, any, any progress in, in whatever place your organization sees fit is going to be beneficial. So, I mean, uh, taking a step is always better than not taking a step. Uh, but I, I always, always urge people to, to take a look at X because it's, you know, it's quick, it's, it's really easy to use, and it's an extremely, extremely powerful tool. You know, it's, it can't be overstated um, the value of a no false positives rule set. Um, I know... Um, our, our very own uh, Greg Williams wrote a blog that released yesterday that's a, a, about like a very real calculation of the benefits of, of no false positives. Um, and so Axe being, being the browser extension out there with the no false positives rule set is a fantastic place to start with, with tooling. Awesome. Thanks, Noah. And we'll put that um, blog post link that you referenced in the chat if people want to check that out. Um, so another question here. What common traits do you see in organizations with killer sustainable accessibility programs in general? Uh, I, I'm sorry, it cut out for me a little bit in the end there. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So what common traits do you see in organizations with killer uh, sustainable accessibility programs? Gotcha. Um, I, I think the two big uh, common threads um, that we see with, with, you know, people out there that are really kicking butt with, with regard to accessibility. One is a very robust training and education culture, you know, specifically around accessibility. Um, you know, there are, there are accessibility trainings that every member of an organization um, would benefit from, you know, just in terms of fundamentally understanding what is digital accessibility, what is accessibility in general, um, and then down into specific coursework for developers, for designers, for testers. You know that 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 also cannot be overstated the the importance of a foundation of of proper training and education around accessibility and what that does for for the organization at large, um, and then uh, you know keeping in in you know in line with that shift left stuff it's it's people doing as much as they can with automation in development right there's a lot of um, very common technologies being used in uh, in development through through agile practices through continuous integration continuous development to test for front-end uh, capabilities you know functional stuff that you know our, our partners out there that are being very successful in accessibility are using those same structures to, to do accessibility testing and doing everything they can in development because it's it's the lowest investment highest reward place to, to really get in there with tooling and doing that so education and automation and testing and development are, are two huge huge uh, things we see our, our, our successful partners doing. Great, thanks Noah. Uh, another really good question here for you. Um, how would you recommend um, I make a resources argument to management to spend more time on accessibility testing? Um, you know, uh, uh, ROI is, is a, big, a big deal, right? And so I think, you know, like I said, uh, that, that Greg Williams blog post gets into some pretty specific numbers around the cost of false positives and um, you know taking a look at how much you know money is spent to fix a bug within an organization and, and, and then kind of backtracking that to say well if we catch these things at earlier stages how much um, 
how much money is saved. You know, I think that the ROI argument is, is probably principal in terms of justifying capital expense or, or, you know, budget for some sort of new tool, right? Is that we'll spend X number of dollars on this tool, but within a year we'll have saved, you know, four X or five X worth of, of resource cost because we're doing things in a more efficient manner. Great. Thanks. Um, Violet has a question about those code snippets that you shared. Um, where can they find access to those or how do they get access to those code snippets? Yeah, so I think um, I'm not exactly sure which uh, which code snippets they're referring to, but I know that like, you know, if I'm using Axe and I, I click on my learn more, so again, Axe is a free tool and I click on learn more, um, usually in the how to fix the problem section, you'll find where, where applicable, you'll find uh, code snippets. So if I, actually, if I go back and we refresh this page, and I go back to my label, you know, we'll, we'll put those types of fixes into um, the, the documentation on how to fix the problem. If you're specifically talking about like uh, the, the editor I was looking at, those are uh, my artifacts, and actually I don't know that they're publicly available. So I know uh, if you were like a licensed a test user, um, a lot of these examples are part of the user manual, um, which is on DQ University. Um, but there is also a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of stuff if you look at the Axe Core, like GitHub repos and you start getting into the libraries there, there's a lot of examples on there. Awesome, thank you. Um, got a follow-up question about World Space of Test. Uh, can it be used with uh, Vue.js, uh, AngularJS, um, and other JavaScript frameworks? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the Attest APIs, um, unlike the Axe, you know, Axe Core JavaScript library, um, there are three primary flavors of the Attest API. You've got uh, Attest. Uh, there's a JavaScript API, a Java API, and a Ruby API. Um, we have some uh, a lot of different you know built-in integrations, but yeah, I mean, at, you, at the end of the day, you you have a JavaScript you know API and library with Attest that can work with Vue, that can work with Angular. Um, you know, you saw me working with uh, Protractor, which which is built, you know, a, a tool specifically designed to, to do automated testing with Angular applications. Um, and I was using a test in there. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely. Great. So um, we you kind of touched on why Axe um, is a really great automated testing tool and the fact that it has no positive, but what other benefits are there um, compared to other automated testing tools um, out in the wild? Yeah, I think your you're two big, um, specifically with Axe, your two big benefits there is that the one is the rules, right? No false positive rule set um, is huge. It, it's, a, it's a rule set that, uh, that is worked on by a lot and a lot of different contributors in the open source uh, community. Um, it's, it's the gold standard. This is the same rule set that you know, some of the largest technology companies, you know, in the world use um, as their default standards. So I think that rule set is is a huge differentiator. And then I think the support, as, as we look at, you know, this support article that I've got here that, that links directly out from Max, you, you've got a very in-depth discussion around, you know, what rule is being broken, what success criteria uh, are, are being violated here specifically, what what guidelines are, is this under, who, who are the 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 populations that are being affected by, you know, this specific issue, and then a really in-depth discussion around how to fix the issue. So I think that that really in-depth support um, is, is also a big differentiator. Because it's, it's one thing to find the issue, but it's totally um, the next step to understand how to fix it. You know, if I just told you that you had four elements missing a label and you might not understand what's wrong with that, you know, if I don't tell you or help you understand why that's an issue or how to fix it, then telling you that it's broken isn't really helpful. Great. And just a follow-up question to that. Can you briefly explain what a false positive is for those who might not know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and this is, uh, again, I, I think this is like the first paragraph of Greg's uh, blog, which I, I believe Ryan stuck the 
um, URL to that in the, the Zoom chat here, but essentially a false positive is that there are testing tools out there that employ rules that are um, probabilistic and not deterministic. So when I say deterministic, I mean our rules uh, will report when something's wrong only when we know it to be wrong and for it to actually be a violation. Um, whereas there are other rule sets out there that might have looser constraints on what they're calling wrong because maybe some of the time it, it will be right and so they still want to report it. So a false positive would be like the tool telling you that you know the form element doesn't have a label but it really does have a label it's just associated in a different way or maybe um, you know it's reporting that there's some sort of color contrast issue uh, but it's not picking up on it correctly. So a false positive is the tool telling you that something is wrong when there's nothing wrong. And so essentially you're sending your, your development team on a wild goose chase, right? Because if, if your testing tells you that this thing is broken and then you spend a bunch of time trying to fix the thing that's broken when it's not really broken, then that's a lot of wasted time. Great, thanks. Um, and we have a quick clarification question here. Um, on the, of the semantics of an automated tool, when you refer to the Axe plugin and call it automated, is the automated part referring to the scanning the entire page rather than doing it manually uh, via hand or tabbing? Um, the plugin itself has to be run manually, so in, the, in that respect, it's not automated, right? Uh, yeah, that is a correct interpretation. And, and it's, uh, it, you know, when you start using the word automated there, I understand that it's uh, somewhat of a semantical nightmare. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's automated in that I click a button and the tool runs, you know, 52 rules for me and reports back all the issues it found on the screen state. Um, it is not automated in that, you know, I can, uh, with just the browser plugin, run it through or like send it to Spider or something like that. Now, at the end of the day, you could argue that underneath that browser extension is an API and there are a lot of ways to uh, create an interface or automation on top of the API, either through that command line interface tool I showed you earlier or leveraging the APIs themselves and part of a larger testing structure. And that way you're sort of automating the automation, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks, Noah. Mm -hmm. um, another question here. Is there a tool to test keyboard only navigation automatically that can spot focusable elements that are not receiving focus? For example, navigation elements, registration form fields, and other actionable items? Um, we, there, not to my knowledge, I guess, I, that there are not rules in, in, in the DQ tools that are there, but to, to my knowledge, uh, the, the keyboard navigation uh, areas for, for testing are a lot, uh, you know, require human intervention to, to know is, is the focus order logical, is the focus there, et cetera. Is it, is it you know, can you see it? Great, thanks. Um, and then for those who want to use Axe in their build process, they want to know that they could do that without the, the licensing, correct? Yep, yeah, that's the, the Axe core libraries are still an open source uh, capability. Perfect. Um, thanks everybody for hopping on today's webinar. Just a reminder, um, this was recorded. We'll be sending out the recording and slides. Uh, thanks again uh, to Noah for doing such a great job and covering everything so thoroughly. And Stay tuned for future webinars um, and stay up to date on those. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.